In this video, we're going to state and prove the Chinese remainder theorem and actually show how one can solve a system of modular congruences using the Chinese remainder theorem. Now, in this video, we're going to take a very group theory perspective to the Chinese remainder theorem as opposed to the number theoretic perspective many people take. So the version of the Chinese remainder theorem that we're going to state and prove is actually a little bit different than what might, one might expect if you saw this in a number theory situation. So we're actually going to find it and prove it with respect to cyclic groups. So the group Z4 cross Zm, so this is the direct product between the cyclic group of order n and the cyclic group of order m. So the group Zn cross Zm is isomorphic to Zmn if and only if the GCD of n and m is equal to 1. So this statement right here gives us a necessary and sufficient condition for when the direct product of two cyclic groups is itself a cyclic group. Now to see the proof, the first thing to observe here is that when you consider these two groups, the cyclic group of order n times n versus the, the product of the cyclic groups Zn and Zm, these are both groups of the same order, right? So the group Znm, that cyclic group clearly has order Z, uh, is clearly going to be order Nm. On the other hand, when you take the direct product of a, uh, excuse me, you take the order of a direct product, that's always equal to the order of G times the order of H, uh, which would then be N times M. So these are both abelian groups of the same order. So to prove, to prove this statement, we just have to determine under one conditions is Zm times Zm cyclic. So we want to show that, that Zn times Zm is cyclic if and only if the GCD is N, uh, the GCD of N and M is equal to 1. Okay, because every cyclic group uh, is uniquely determined by its order. That is, if we can prove that this group is cyclic, then since they have the same order, that would then force an isomorphism between those two. So let, let's investigate why Zn times Zn would be cyclic if and only if the GCD there is one. So for the sake of simplicity, let G be a shorthand for this group Zn times Zm. And let's take an arbitrary element inside of G. So we're going to take K comma L as this element. Well, in the previous video, we proved, in fact, how to compute the order of an element in a direct product. So let's say that the order of the first term is R, and the order of the second term, L, let's say that's equal to S. So then the previous video, we proved that the order of, the, the order of this pair, K, L, is going to be the least common multiple of R and S. So in particular, we see, well, well, well so... Since K has order R and K belongs to Zn, then by Lagrange's theorem, we know that R divides N. But by similar reason, since L has order S and L belongs to the cyclic group Zm, that would imply that S divides M. So since R divides N and since S divides M, the least common multiple of R and S is going to divide the least common multiple of n and m. So this condition right here tells us that any, any common multiple of n and m will also be a common multiple of r and s. So the smallest common multiple of r and s will divide the smallest common multiple of n and m. Okay? So that's where we are right now. And notice that the significance here of the LCM of r s is because it's the order of the element in play right here. Well, the order of every element in G divides the least common multiple of N and M. Because we know uh, we know that everything in Zn, if you raise it to the nth power, will give you the identity. And everything in Zm, if you raise it to the nth power, gives you the identity. So if we take an element such as K, L, and we raise it to the LCM of N and M power right here, this will equal the identity. Because any multiple of n will send k to the identity, and any multiple of m will send l to the identity, like so. So raising something, uh, raising something to the LCM of n and m will give you the identity if you're inside this group G. That's can, that's a completely, uh, completely legit statement, and that's you know that, that's where we can derive statements like this from. Okay, so come down, come down to this observation right here. So this observation right here tells us that the maximal order of any element in G is going to be the least common multiple of N and M. In group theory, this is referred to as the exponent of the group. That is the smallest number for which every element raised to that power gives you the identity. 
okay? So a quick example of what I mean by that here is if you take the cyclic groups, oh, sorry, take the abelian group Z4 versus the Klein 4 group, right? In the, in the cyclic group, the exponent is of, this, of the group is going to be 4 because since you have an element of order 4, particularly like 1 and 3, uh, though there, there's no order that will get the idea any smaller than that. On the other hand, if you take like the Klein 4 group, let's call the elements A, B, and C, this group has the property that the exponent is actually equal to 2. But Because if, if I take A squared or B squared or C squared, or of course the identity squared, this is always equal to the identity. So the group has order four, that's how many elements are in the group. And if you raise something to the fourth power, you do get the identity, but it turns out a smaller number can do it for the entire abelian group. And this is the exponent here. So what we have going on here in this conversation is that the least common multiple of N and M, one could make the argument is the exponent of the group. Uh, but if we want the group to be cyclic, the, the, if you want the group to be cyclic, the abelian group to be cyclic, then the exponent of the group has to equal the order of the group. That has, there has to be an element there has to be an element G whose order is actually the size of the whole group. That's what's necessary to be cyclic. So let's, for the sake of contradiction, suppose that the least common multiple of N and M is strictly less than M, uh, N times M. That would suggest that there cannot be an element of order N M, and therefore the group cannot be cyclic. But what's the relationship between LCMs and GCDs? Well, we know that if you take the product of LCM and GCDs, that's equal to the product of the two numbers N and M, which you can then write it as the LCM of N and M is equal to MN and the GCD of NM. So if this inequality was strict, that means the GCD can't equal one. So the GCD is some positive number that shrinks this product or this fraction down to give us the LCM here. So the LCM is strictly less than the product only when the GCD is not equal to one. So under the condition that the GCD is equal to one, then that means that the LCM of N and M would equal M and N. And therefore, in that situation, we would get that the exponent and the order are actually the same thing. And in particular, what we saw in the previous, in the previous video, the order of the element one comma one is gonna be, well, we, we saw that it's equal to the LCM of M and N. And so if those two things are the same thing, that would mean that the order of this element is the order of the group, so it's cyclic. Uh, and this, these, of course, are only equal to each other when the GCD is equal to 1, like so. Uh, so some important corollaries to this result, this Chinese remainder theorem. So first of all, we can induct on this. Like we did it with two factors a moment ago. You can have as many direct factors as you want. Um, and so the order, uh, I should say that this group will be cyclic, the direct product of these cyclic groups will be cyclic, right? The product N1 times N2 times N3 up to NK will, when their common GCD is equal to one. This follows from a straightforward induction argument that I'll leave for the viewer to figure out. Uh, the next thing to mention also is that if you have a prime factorization of the integer N, then the cyclic group ZN has a natural decomposition, natural factorization as direct products for which you can then take cyclic groups of prime power orders, which again, this is a fairly immediate consequence of the previous corollary for which this is immediate induction argument following the Chinese remainder theorem we saw on the previous slide. Now, what I have in front of us now is our last corollary for the Chinese remainder theorem. And I wanna mention that in number theory, the Chinese remainder theorem typically looks like this. That is, let n1, n2, up to nk be some list of positive integers such that pairwise GCDs are equal to one. Um, for, and then for any integers a1 up to ak, the system of equations, you see this system of modular congruences. x is congruent to a1 mod n1. ax is congruent to a, uh, that should be a2 right there, mod n2, all the way up to x is congruent to ak mod nk. So you have this system of linear congruences. This has a unique solution modulo n1 times n2 up to nk. So th again, this is how one typically thinks of the Chinese remainder theory, and this is how it's always presented in a number theory course. It gets the name Chinese remainder theorem uh, because of the writings of Sun Ji, for which uh, he wrote, translated into English, of course, there are certain things whose number is unknown. If we count them by threes, we have two left over. By fives, we have three left over. By sevens, 
two are left over? How many things are there? So this was a math problem presented where you had to figure out the number based upon different remainders that the number had. That in modern uh, mathematics is equivalent to solving this system of modular equations right here. Now this core, I'm actually gonna present this as a corollary because from the group theoretic perspective we've taken, this conclusion here is immediate from the theorems that we've already proven. So what we have to do is we take an isomorphism from Z n one n two up to n k to the direct product from one to k of the Z n k's, right? So we proved previously from from on the previous slide here we mentioned that oh if all of these of all these GCDs are one then this cyclic group is isomorphic to this direct product of cyclic groups. It's an isomorphism and so in particular it's surjective. So there exists some element x inside the cyclic group such that when you take phi of x, it'll equal a1, a2, up to ak. There's some element that maps onto this. There's got to be. And that's what we get from surjectivity. And since it's an injective map, it's an isomorphism, we get that um, there's a unique x that does it. So that gives us the unique solution to the system. Now, again, in number theory, uh, oftentimes we try to generalize this to be like, okay, if we have some of these GCD conditions, we can talk about when there are, when there are solutions, when there's multiple solutions. Um, is this, this lecture series is not about number theory. It's on algebra. I'm not going to go into all the fine details about that. But I do want to show you how one can solve a system of linear congruences. So let's say we have to find a number which is congruent to 3 mod 4 and is congruent to 4 mod 5. The Chinese remainder theorem gives us a proof that it exists, but let's actually come up with a procedure to show what that number actually would be. So since x is congruent to 3 mod 4, that tells me that there's some integer k such that x is equal to 3 plus 4k, you know, for some integer k, like I said. What we can then do is we can then substitute that uh, this expression into the second congruence right here. So we see that 3 plus 4k is congruent to 4 mod 5. We can make that substitution in there and work through it. If we subtract 3 from both sides, we get 4k is congruent to 1, right? And since since 4 and 5 are since 4 and 5 are uh, relatively prime, their GCD is 1. That means that 4 has a multiplicative inverse when we work mod 5, and it turns out that number is is 4 itself. If we times both sides of the equation by 4, we end up with k equals 4. Notice that 4 times 4 is 16, which is 1 mod 5, because it's 1 more than 15, which is a multiple of 5. So the solution here would be k is congruent to 4 mod 5. Well, that means that k, right, k is equal to 4 plus a multiple of 5. Uh, let's call it L in this situation. And so we're going to then back substitute this into the observation we had before, like so. Uh, so we get that x is equal to 3 plus 4 times k, but k is 4 plus 5 times l. Distribute the 4, we get x is equal to 3 plus 16 plus 4 times 5 times l. Of course, 3 plus 16 is equal to 19, so we get x equals 19 plus 20l. So what we see here is that x should be congruent to 19 mod 20 which the significance of 20, of course, is 20 is 4 times 5, the product of the two. And so 19 is the unique solution to this uh, system of congruences up to mod 20. And so this is a pretty, a pretty neat application of the Chinese remainder theorem. We can solve these linear congruences this way. It's kind of like doing linear algebra over different, uh, different rings, right? Um, I also want to mention that other, among other applications, the Chinese remainder theorem can be helpful in computer design, in fact, like with regard to calculations of large integers and uh, parallel processing and such. Um, if anyone's interested in learning more about that, you should check out uh, the example in chapter 16 of Judson's textbook. Uh, at the time of the recording, it's example 1645. You'd want to check out that example in the preceding three uh, paragraphs in the textbook. It'll give you some more details on how uh, the Chinese remainder theorem helps with uh, computation, computations on a computer.